and we believe there's still uh, meaningful room for improvement there. Um, regarding autopilot and AI, our vehicles now driven over half a billion miles with FSD beta, full self-driving beta, uh, and that number is growing rapidly. Uh, we recently completed um, a 10,000 uh, GPU cluster of H100s. We think probably bringing it into operation faster than anyone's ever brought, brought uh, that much compute per unit time into production, uh, since training is the fundamental limiting factor on progress with full self-driving and vehicle autonomy. Um, <clears throat> we're also seeing uh, significant promise with FSD version 12. This is the end-to-end -end, uh, AI where it's photon count in, controls out. Uh, or really, you can think of it as we, there's a, just a, a large bitstream coming in and a, and a tiny bitstream going out, uh, compressing reality into a, a very small set of outputs. Uh, which is actually kind of how humans work. The vast majority of, of human data input is optics from our eyes. Uh, and so we are, like the car, photons in, controls out, with neural nets, just neural nets in the middle. Um, it's very interesting to think about that. Uh, we will continue to invest significantly in AI development. Um, as this is really the, the, the massive game changer. Um, and I mean, success in this regard in the long term, uh, I, I think has the potential to make Tesla the most valuable company in the world by, by far. Um, if you have fully autonomous cars at scale and fully autonomous uh, humanoid robots that are truly useful, it's not clear what the limit is. <clears throat> Regarding en energy storage, we deployed four gigawatt hours of energy of storage products in Q3. Uh, and uh, as this business is, grows, uh, the energy vision is becoming our highest margin uh, business. Uh, energy and service now contribute over half a billion dollars to quarterly profit. Uh, the Cybertruck, I know a lot of people are excited about the Cybertruck. Yeah. Uh, I am too. I've driven the car. It's an amazing product. Uh, I, I do want to emphasize that there will be uh, enormous challenges in, in reaching volume production with the Cybertruck um, and then in making the Cybertruck uh, cash flow positive. This is this is simply normal for when, when you've got a, a product with a lot of new technology or any 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 new vehicle, brand new vehicle program, but especially one that is as different and advanced as the Cybertruck, uh, you will have problems proportionate to how many new things you're trying to solve at scale. So I just want to emphasize that while I think this is potentially our best product ever, uh, and I think it is our best product ever, um, it is going to be require immense work to reach volume production and be cash flow positive at a price that people can afford. Um, often people do not understand what is truly hard. That is why I say prototypes are easy, production is hard. Uh, people think it's the idea or you make a prototype, you, you design a car. And it's not as though designing a car is, is, is that just anyone can do it. It, it does require taste, it does require effort to design a prototype. But the difficulty of going from a prototype to volume production uh, is like 10,000% harder to get to volume production than to make the prototype in the first place. And then it is even harder than that to reach positive cash flow. That is why there have not been uh, new car startups that have been successful uh, for 100 years, apart from Tesla. So, um, you know, I just want to temper expectations for Cybertruck. Um, it's a great product, but financially, it will take, I don't know, a year to 18 months before it is a significant positive cash flow contributor. Uh, I, I wish there was some way to that to be different, but 
that's uh, that's my best guess. Um, you know, so it, it, it really the, the, the demand is is off, is off the charts. We have over a million people who have reserved the car, so it's not it's not a demand issue, but we have to make it, um, and we need to make it at a price that people can afford. Insanely difficult things. Uh, in conclusion, uh, we continue to focus on uh, ramping production while maintaining a uh, positive cash flow. And we continue to target uh, and expect to have around 1.8 million vehicle deliveries, uh, as stated earlier this year. Um, the Tesla AI team is, I think, one of the world's best. And I think it is actually by far the world's best when it comes to real world AI. Um, I'll say that again, Tesla has the best real world AI team on earth, period. Um, and it's getting better. Um, and uh, lastly, I wanted to thank uh, all of our employees who are making a lot of extra effort during uncertain times. Thank you very much for your hard work and the impact that you're making. Thank you very much, Elon. And our CFO, Wybuff, have some opening remarks as well. Thanks, Martin. The vehicle deliveries in Q3 outpaced production, and we had yet another record quarter of profitability in our energy business. Congratulations to the Tesla team for their continued focus on operational excellence as we navigate through a period of economic uncertainty, higher interest rates, and shifting consumer sentiment. As Elon mentioned, our Q3 operational and, uh, and financial performance was impacted by planned downturns for our factory upgrades. This was necessary to allow for further factory improvements and production rate increases. Despite such factory shutdowns, our cost per vehicle decreased to approximately 37,500. We saw sequential decreases in material cost and freight. Reducing the cost of our vehicles is our top priority. On the operating expenses front, R&D expenses continue to rise to cyber, due to Cybertruck prototype builds and pilot production testing, combined with spend on AI technologies like full self driving, Optimus, and Dojo. We have and will continue to make investments in these areas, and hence our capital expenditure and R&D will continue to grow in the near term. However, our focus is to continue making investments through positive cash flow from operations. This year itself, we have generated operating cash flows of approximately $8.9 billion and free cash flows of approximately $2.3 billion. Our other businesses are becoming more prominent on a standalone basis, with energy business leading the charge primarily from the growth in megabyte deployments. Our services and other businesses on a year-on-year -year basis also continue to show positive momentum as we benefit from our growing fleet. As regards our pricing strategy, in addition to what we have shared before, I want to elaborate that most car buying happens with one or other form of financing, and hence, we also view pricing in terms of monthly costs for the customer. And therefore, as interest costs in the U.S. have risen substantially, it has required us to adjust the price of our vehicles to keep the monthly cost in parity. We've tried to offset such adjustments by our focus on reducing costs. However, there is an inherent lag in cost reductions, which in turn impacts margins. To that extent, we recently announced a partner vehicle leasing program in the U.S., whereby you can get a standard range Model Y for as low as $399 a month. In conclusion, as we navigate through a challenging economic environment, we're focused on reducing costs, maximizing delivery volumes, and continuing making investments in the future, in particular AI and other next generation platform. We believe this strategy positions us well for the long term. Once again, I would like to thank the Tesla team for their efforts in the last quarter. Thank you very much. And now let's go to investor questions. Uh, the first investor question comes from Craig. How many Cybertruck deliveries do you anticipate for 2024? It's difficult to make an accurate guess at this point. Um, going back to what I said earlier, that the ramp is going to be extremely difficult. Um, and uh, like, like I said, it's, there's, there's, there's no way around that. If, if you try to make, if, if we just try to do some copycat uh, vehicle design of which there are literally 200 models that are 
slight vari variations on a theme in the in the combustion engine world. Uh, just a, just a, distinctions without a difference. Uh, then you know it's really not that hard. But if you want to do something radical and innovative and, and something really special like the, the like the Cybertruck, um, it is extremely difficult because there's nothing to copy. You have to invent not just the car, but the way to make the car. So the, the more uncharted the territory, the less predictable the outcome. Now, I can say that if you say, well, where will things end up? I think we'll end up with it roughly a quarter million cyber trucks a year. Um, and uh, but I, 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 we're not, I don't think we're going to reach that output rate next year. I, I think we're, we'll probably reach it sometime in 2025. That's my best guess. Thank you. Uh, the, the second question is, can you provide a progress update on the 4680 cell? particularly progress towards performance improvements and cost savings outlined on battery day. Thank you. Uh, sure thing, Martin. <clears throat> um, 4680 cell production in Texas increased 40% quarter over quarter. Uh, congrats to the Texas team for producing their 20 million cell off of line one. Uh, Texas is now our primary 4680 facility. Um, we're heavily focused on quality. Scrap is down 40% quarter over quarter. Uh, with the increased volume and yield improvements, cell costs consistently improved month over month within the quarter, although we have a lot more work to do to achieve our steady state goals. And that is our priority. Um, the Cybertruck cell with 10% higher energy than our Model Y cell started production on line two in Texas. Uh, this quarter, we convert to building 100% Cybertruck cells to simplify and focus the factory as we ramp all four lines in phase one over the next three quarters. Phase two of the Texas 4680 facility is currently under construction. The additional four lines incorporate further capital efficiencies over phase one, and our target is for them to start producing in late 2024. Uh, lastly, in Cato, uh, we're retooling uh, to enable large scale pallet runs of our next generation cell designs. Cato's long term goal is to be the launch pad for new cells, one generation ahead of our mass production facilities, enabling faster iteration and smoother ramp ups of new designs. Thank you. Um, the next question um, from institutional investor is, could you please provide an update on capacity expansion plans for companies, factories in Berlin and Austin, and the opening schedule of Gigafactory in Mexico? Uh, Berlin and Austin factory, uh, the current priority is actually maximize the output from our existing lines uh, by laser focus on uh, efficiency improvement. As always, maintaining a high quality and reducing per unit cost will be as critical as growing the production volume. Um, for Mexico, uh, we're working on infrastructure and factory design in parallel with the engineering development of the new production that will be manufactured there. Um, that's all I can share for that. In Mexico, we're, we're laying the groundwork to uh, begin construction um, and uh, doing, doing all the long lead items. Um, but I think we want to just get a sense for what the global economy is like before we go full tilt um, on the Mexico factory. Um, I'm worried about the high interest rate environment that we're in. Um, it's, I just can't emphasize this enough that uh, for the vast majority of people buying a car is about the monthly payment. Uh, and as interest rates rise, the proportion of that monthly payment that is interest increases naturally. So uh, that's if, if interest rates remain high or if they go even higher, uh, it's that much harder to for people to buy the car. They simply cannot afford it. Um, so um, and, and we are tracking, I believe, at this point for Model Y to be the best selling car on Earth, but not just in revenue, but in unit volume. If you compare that to the other vehicles that are you know, number two and number three and whatnot, they, they cost much less than our car. Uh, so, you know, we, we're just hit, hitting low of large numbers situations here. I know people want us to advertise and we are advertising. Um, I think there is some, there's something to, there, there is a, something to be gained on the advertising front. I don't think it's nothing. Um, but informing people of a car that is great, that they cannot afford, doesn't, doesn't really help. Um, so that, that's, 
that is really the thing that must be solved is to make the car portable or you know the average person can't apply it for any amount of money um or they or for they simply can't afford it they can't afford it so this is a big deal um okay thank you very much uh the next question is when do you expect Model 3 Highland to be available in the U.S.? Um, I just wanted to address that, unfortunately, we don't answer product-related questions and timings on earnings calls, so let's go to the next one. Um, current sell-side consensus as assumes that Tesla will deliver 2.3 million vehicles in 2024, representing 28% growth versus 2023 guidance. Is this growth rate achievable without any mass market launches in 2024? And when does Tesla expect to return to its 50% long-term CAGR? Thanks for the question. When we look at 2024, there are a lot of moving pieces. You know, I just talked about what is happening in the macroeconomic environment. So we're focused on growing our volumes in a very cost-efficient manner and are carefully reviewing all our options. And we'll be able to provide a much more meaningful update at our next earnings call. Yeah, and I mean, the risk of stating the obvious, um, it is not possible to have a compound growth rate of 50% forever, or you will exceed the mass of the known universe. Uh, so, but I, I think we will grow very rapidly and much faster than any other car company on earth by far. Thank you. Uh, next question is, do you have a, an approximate timeline in mind for the robotaxi driven or non-driven what excites you most about how this project is progressing? Well, the rubber taxi is like necessarily non-driven. <laughs> um, the uh, I, I guess I am I am very excited about our progress with autonomy. Um, the end-to-end, -end, nothing but nets, uh, self-driving software is amazing. Um, I, I drives me all around Austin with no interventions. Um, so, you know, this is clearly the, the right move. Um, you know, so it, it's, it's, just, I know it's, it's really, really pretty amazing. Um, and obviously that same software and approach will enable Optimus to do useful things uh, and, and enable optimists to to learn how to do things simply by looking. Um, so, you know, extremely exciting in the long term. Um, as I as I mentioned before, you know, given that uh, economic output is number of people times productivity, if you no longer have a constraint on on people, effectively you've got a humanoid robot that can do as much as you'd like, your your, your economy is quasi infinite or you know, infinite for all intents and purposes. Um, so and I don't think anyone's going to do it better than Tesla, not by a long shot. Yeah, bus dynamics is impressive, but their robot lacks a brain, sort of like the you know, Wizard of Oz or whatever. It's <laughs> immense. <laughs> yeah, lacks a brain. Um, and, and then uh, you also need to be able to design the humanoid robot in a way, such a way that it can be mass manufactured. Um, and then at some point, the robots will manufacture the robots. Uh, now, obviously, we need to be, make sure that you know, there's a good place for humans in that future, and we do not create some variant of the Terminator <laughs> outcome. Um, so we're going to put a lot of effort into localized control of the humanoid robot. So you, you know, basically anyone will be able to shut it off locally, um, and you can't change that, uh, even if you. With, like a software update, you can't change that. It has to be hard coded. Thank you. Uh, the next question is uh, Why was the price dropped on FSD if it is getting better and Robotaxi is expected so soon? Well, 
well, we just wanted to make it more affordable uh, so more people could try it. Uh, yeah, I, I think over time, the price of FSD will increase proportionate to its value. Uh, so I would regard the current price as a kind of a temporary low. Thank you. Uh, the next question is again on FSD. Uh, Mercedes is accepting legal liability for when its level three autonomous driving system drive pilot is active. Is Tesla planning to accept legal liability for FSD? And if so, when? Well, there's a lot of people that assume we, we have legal liability, <laughs> judging by the lawsuits. Uh, we're certainly not being let that off the hook on that front, whether we like would like to or, or wouldn't like to. I mean, I think it's important to remember for everyone that Mercedes' system is limited to a few roads in Nevada and some certain cities in California. It doesn't work in the snow or the fog. It must have a lead car, marked planes, only 40 miles per hour. Our system is meant to be holistic and drive in any conditions, so we obviously have a much more capable approach, but um, you know, with, with those kind of limitations, it's really not very useful. You know, I, I think so, some people understand the profundity of the Tesla AI system, most very, but very, very few. Um, it's, it's basically baby AGI. It has to understand reality in order to drive. Baby, baby AGI. Thank you. Uh, the next question on Optimus, will Optimus be working on Gigafactory lines next year? If so, how many uh, would you guess uh, will be deployed? I think at this point we are not ready to discuss details of the Optimus program, but we will make provide periodic updates online. Uh, so as you can see, where you know Optimus a year ago could barely walk. And now it can do yoga. <laughs> <laughs> so a few years from now, it can probably do ballet. Sounds good. Um, and the last question uh, from investors is, neural net path planning represents a significant advance in capability and safety for FSD. What steps is Tesla taking to make this technology available outside the US? Yeah, our approach has been to try to get it, to, like the more places we try to make it work, the harder the problem is. Um, so the reason we don't do it in all countries simultaneously is that it would take much longer to get, to make it work anywhere at all. Uh, so um, that's why it's currently just uh, North America. Uh, and, and also for most parts of the world, you have to get approval before deploying things. Whereas uh, in the US, uh, you can deploy things at risk, or at least can take liability for what you deploy. So um, it's uh, whereas most countries require some sort of extensive appro approval program. Um, so we all, we only want to go through that extensive approval program when we think it's kind of ready for prime time in that country. I apologize that it's not not in those countries, but. But we keep finding ways to make it better. And uh, it really it needs to drive, drive, it needs to drive such that it exceeds the even unsupervised, significantly exceeds the probability of injury of a human. It's significantly better, it's low, low, a lower probability of injury than, than a human by far. I think we're, we're, we're tracking to that point very quickly. Um, obviously, in the past, I've been overly optimistic about this. Um, the reason I've been overly optimistic is that the progress tends to sort of look like a log a log curve, uh, which is that you have kind of rapid initial improve, improvements and that if you were to extrapolate that sort of rapid, fairly linear rate of improvement, you, you you get to self-driving quite quickly, but then 
the, the, the rate of improvement curves over logarithmically um, and starts to asymptote. Um, that's now happened several times. I would characterize our progress in real world AI as a, a series of stacked log curves. Uh, I think that is also true in other parts of AI, like LLMs and whatnot, a series of stacked log curves. Um, each log curve gets higher than the last one. So if you keep stacking them, if you keep stacking logs, eventually you get to FSD. Thank you. Uh, let's now go to analyst questions. Uh, the first question comes from Will Stein from Truist. Uh, Will, please go ahead um, and unmute yourself. Great. Thanks so much for taking my question and thanks for all the updates today. Um, we uh, we learned earlier in the call, it, it sounds like um, you don't think the truck will ramp to significant volume until its third year of production. Should we have a similar anticipation for the ramp of the next gen platform? Or is there any reason that we should be maybe more optimistic or pessimistic about the uh, ramp profile there? Thank you. Yeah, I, I mean, to be clear, it's, it's it's not really the third year of production. It's kind of like the 18th month of production is roughly uh, my guess. So it's just that they happen to, it'll happen, is that the, it starts this year, spans next year, and gets to 2025. So technically there are three calendar years in there, but there's actually only 18, 18 months, not three years. I would be very disappointed if it took us, and that, that would, that would shocking if it took us three years mm -hmm. um, but 18 months from initial deliveries um, to have to reach volume and and reach prosperity with an immense I, I can't tell you how much the blood sweat and tears level required to achieve that is just staggering I've been through it many times and then here, here we go again um, you know um, S similar path for the next gen platform I mean, there's like unique complexity to cyber. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, cyber truck is. Uh, yeah, I mean, we dug our own grave with cyber cyber truck. You know, <laughs> nobody. And you know, in general, I probably nobody digs or grave better than themselves. And so, <laughs> uh, I, I, you know, it it is it is. Um, you know, cyber truck is one of those one of those special pro products that comes along only once in a long while. Um, and, and special products that come along once in a long while are just incredibly difficult to bring to market, to reach volume, to, to be prosperous. Um, it's, it's fundamental to the nature of the, the newness. Um, so now the sort of high volume, low cost, uh, smaller vehicle is actually much more conventional. Uh, it's, yeah, in terms of like the technologies we're putting into it, we didn't have to invent how to bend full hard stainless steel or have mega 9,000 ton castings or the largest hot stamping in the world or new yeah high voltage. Evolutionary quite in the same way as the Cybertruck. I, I, I think it will be quite a fast ram. Um, so, it, as Laws was saying, we're, we're doing everything possible to simplify that vehicle in order to achieve a um, units per minute level that uh, is unheard of in the auto industry. Yeah, I mean. The simplification makes it easier to automate. It also makes it lower cost. Yeah, like it's the, the intrinsically lower cost. Yeah. <laughs> Just to be clear, is 
it'll be cool, but it's it's utilitarian. Um, it's not meant to be, you know, fill you with, you know, all and magic. It's a uh, can get you from A to B. And it, it'll be so beautiful, but it's a uh, it's utilitarian. It's, it's a utility. Doesn't have fourteen inches of travel and its suspension. <laughs> yeah, as an example. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, the Cybertruck has a lot of bells and whistles. All right, thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Pierre Ferragou from New Street Research. Hey, um, uh, can you hear me fine? Yes. 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 Um, hey, um, I have a first like a follow up question on uh, uh, FSD um, um, and pricing and adoption. So I, I agree with you that as FSD uh, improves, we should see its value um, increasing. But I guess like the ultimate um, uh, value of FSD, which is to be able to handle like um, uh, a robot taxi, is not going to necessarily interest everybody. And you have a bit of a degraded version that would be like a chauffeur service where the car drives by itself, but you still have to be in the car and around. And then there is like the hands-on, uh, eyes-on uh, version of the service. Um, and and I guess, you know, there should be like much lower cost, lower feature kind of va variance of the service that could have a very large penetration on your install base and more expensive one that would remain at a lower penetration level. So. I'm just wondering if you're taking that, and last but not least, like the simplest version of FSD are available and are going to work from a technical perspective, probably before like the ultimate robot taxi uh, version can work, if ever. Um, and so I'm wondering how you take that into account in how you're thinking like the financial contribution of FSD over time and, and whether you could um, evolve your pricing uh, along that kind of tiers to uh, in increase uh, adoption. Yeah, I mean, the, a fully autonomous vehicle, I, th I think here you, you know, sort of the economics of a fully autonomous vehicle are, are truly astounding uh, in, a, in a positive way. Um, when you look at uh, passenger vehicles today, they, they only get about 10 to 12 hours of usage per week. That's you know, if, you, if you drive an hour and a half a day on average, uh, that's roughly 10 hours a week out of 168 hours. Um, and then there's also you're going to have, have parking and insurance. Um, you got to take care of the car. It's like there's a lot of, a lot of overhead. Um, so, I mean, it, it, yeah, you, it's like the economics of the system are just um, insanely positive if, if given that the car like all of the cars we're making and have made for a while we believe are capable of full autonomy um, so then if you if you're able to say increase the utility of that car by I don't know, a factor of five which slowly means that you it's being used for maybe 50 hours a week um, out of 168, so you still not as you still assume that still assumes less than a third of the hours of, of the week are it is it is doing something useful. Um, you've increased the value of that by by five, but it still costs the same. Like you have something, then 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 we're a, we're a hardware company with software margins. Pierre, do you have a follow up? Um, yes, I, I'd have actually a follow-up on, on a different to topic for you, uh, Vape have if, if that's okay. Um, it, it's about like your gross margin in the quarter. Could you give us a sense of um, like in uh, in how the gross margin evolved uh, sequentially? How much was the impact of idle costs? Um, how much was like the sequential benefit? I imagine of production ramping at um, Berlin and Austin, and then I saw like this massive jump in energy storage. Um, uh, very strong positive surprise. So if you can give us um, the background on that and tell us, you know, how we should think about that gross margin going forward. Okay, th thanks for that question. So in terms of, uh, you have a, you have a few different aspects of your question. So for 
if I just look at from Q3 perspective, you know, obviously factory idle time had an impact. It did impact by, I mean, I won't give you the exact percentage, but it had decent impact for the quarter. And, you know, when you look at uh, the other pieces which we are trying to do, we did see certain of our other factories ramping up pretty well, right? And they actually contributed pretty well to the margin for this quarter. In fact, one of the factories pretty, came pretty close to, in terms of per unit cost, to where we are for one of our other established factory, which is Fremont. So that, that was a positive in the quarter. When it comes to energy margins, you know, Megapack deployment was the key driver there. And that product has done well. I mean, on the cost curve also, we've been able to do a lot there. But I do want to caution that, you know, Megapack deployments are a bit lumpy. So, yes, we had a great quarter this period. But depending upon where we are trying to deploy that product, in the mar in different markets, you would see periods where then there would be uh, downward pressure on deployment because of us trying to get the product to that exact place where yeah, it product in, product in transit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, let's go to Rod Lash from Wolf Research. Uh, Rod, feel free to unmute yourself. Thanks. Um, Really nice to see the rate of uh, vehicle cost improvement despite the downtime that you took. Um, you've taken now about $2,000 out of the average vehicle cost over the past year. Can you give us maybe a sense of the rate of improvement that you see uh, from the changes that you alluded to, the factory changes you alluded to? Is there a way maybe to convey the speed of improvement on your existing product from here and then related to that, um, can you share the timing of your next gen, the, the lower priced uh, product that you talked about earlier this year? Yeah, so just in terms of product margins, uh, there are lots of puts and takes when you look into this. You know, there are certain things which we control and there are certain things which we don't control. You know, we get, we expect that we'll get some benefits from our cost reduction efforts, which are all underway. But on the other hand, we just finished our factory upgrades late in Q3. Some of these factors are still in the early RAM phase in Q4. We're still not up to where we want those factories to be, so they'll impact in the near term. Plus, like Elon mentioned, we're going to be ramping Cybertruck, which is going to be another headwind which we will be dealing with. On top of all that, you know, there's overall uncertainty in the macroeconomic environment, which even makes it harder to predict precisely as to where we land. But yes, this is something which, you know, it's it's an evolving thing which we're observing every day and reacting to it on a daily basis. I, I would just say that on the cost reduction efforts, like we we are not, we are unflagging in our pursuit of uh, additional cost downs for 2024. We do have a, a good pipeline of, of them uh, in work on both the engineering side and the factory operation side. And, um, you know, our intention is to like maintain or exceed the trend that you saw. We're trying as hard as we possibly can. The timing of the next gen product, um, can you share that? Uh, not at this time. Okay. And just uh, as a follow up, uh, obviously price is also a driver of demand, but it, that's obviously not happening in a vacuum. Um, and you, you mentioned that, um, I think you mentioned it at some point during this call that you're also maybe hitting the law of large numbers on some of your products. Can you just share how you're thinking about price elasticity just at this point and in this macro environment um, and any thoughts along those lines? I think that there's very significant price elasticity. Um, I mean, to be totally frank, if our car that's the same as a RAV4, nobody would buy a RAV4. Or at least they're very unlikely to. Um, um, it's worth noting that a lot of these incentives, like the you know, tax credit and whatnot, um, 
they're actually very difficult for the average person to access because they most people do not have 10 grand, you know, or even $7,500 burning a hole in their bank account. Um, large, large number of people are, are living paycheck to paycheck and at, with with a lot of debt. They've got credit card debt, mortgage debt. Um, so, yeah, it's, it's, uh, that, that's, that's reality for most people. It's, it's sometimes difficult for uh, people who are, you know, high income earners, you know, and I'd say high would be like someone who's earning over $200,000 a year um, to understand what life is like for someone who is earning fifty or sixty or seventy thousand dollars a year, which is most people. Um, so, um, so that like for, for a lot of people, like these these tax credits just they, they can't they can't front seventy five hundred dollars for you know eighteen months or, or, or even six months to get for, for the tax credit, and they actually don't in some cases even have that they don't have seventy five hundred dollars in taxes. <laughs> so. Um, you know, it's a, so it's really just but for the vast majority of people is how much money do they have to pay immediately and how much per month? That's it. And you can stop right there. And our, and our car is still much more expensive than a RAV4 when you look at it that way. Uh, yeah, and um, one other thing which I'll add, you know, when, when you look at, you know, car buying in general, we're trying to get to the next set of EV adapters. And they well, use not even not an EV adapter. Just next, who wants a great car? Exactly. It's it's not a, you know, sometimes you get these like, you know, honestly, I would say it's like somewhat correlates with the why doesn't everyone work from home crowd? I'm like, uh, I mean, this is like some real Marie Antoinette vibes from people that say why does everyone work from home? Like, what about all the people that have to come to the factory and, and, and fill up the cars? What about all the people that have to go to, to, to the restaurant and make your food and deliver your food? It's like, what are you talking about? You, I mean, how detached from reality does, does the work from home crowd have to be? Um, while they take advantage of all those who do, who cannot work from home. So, I mean, you have to say, like, why did I sleep in the factory so many times because it mattered. Um, so, um, so I, I just can't emphasize not how, again, how important cost is. I, it's, it's, not, it's not an optional thing for most people. It is a necessary thing. Um, we have to make our cars more affordable. So people can buy it, and 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 I, you know, I keep harping on this interest thing, but I mean, it's just, it just right raises the cost of the car. I mean, I, we're looking at an 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 internal analysis, which I don't know we, people, I, I, we think is 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 more or less on track. That when you look at the cost re, or the price reductions we've made in, uh, say, the Model Y. Um, and you compare that to how much people's monthly payment has risen due to interest rates. The price of the Model Y is almost unchanged. If you factor in the change in the interest rates. Yes, which is the, the thing, this is what I'm trying to say. The thing that matters is the monthly pay. It's, it's, it's how much money do they have to put down? And do they literally have that in their bank account or will the check bounce? Yeah. Uh, and then what is the monthly payment? And it doesn't matter how if, if that monthly payment is principal interest or whatever. It's just a, a number, and that number has to not cause their bank account to go negative. Um, that's it. So, uh, you know, going, going from near zero interest rates to the current very high interest rates, uh, the actual monthly payment is basically the same. It's just a bunch more of it is going to interest. Um, and there are some some incremental challenges beyond that, which is the difficulty of getting credit at all has increased. And so the number of people who simply cannot get credit, period. Um, even if they've got a job and everything's solid, they, you know, the, the, the banks are, you know, a little gun shy on handing out credit, um, given that a bunch of them kicked the bucket earlier this year. Um, yeah, there's also just fewer options, even if they <laughs> hand out credit. There's 
all fear <laughs> banks together. It's like, does your bank still exist? Yeah. Well, uh, if your bank does not exist, uh, you have to establish a relationship with a new bank. Um, and, um, you know, so a lot of regional banks are, you know, died and, I mean, even Credit Suisse, I mean, geez, that's, that was a shocker, you know, got a like 160 year old ish Swiss institution um, that doesn't exist anymore. That's mind blowing. Um, and uh, I think there's still quite a few shoes to drop on the, the bad credit situation. Uh, res I mean, commercial real estate obviously is um, in a terrible shape. Um, you know, credit card debt has been rising significantly. The credit card interest rates are usurious. Uh, I mean, over twenty percent interest rates, meaning like, which over time is just it becomes uh, obviously extremely punishing. If, because if somebody's paying twenty percent interest on their credit cards, it means they cannot pay them off. And if you cannot pay them off, and you're still accruing interest at twenty percent. That you had, that that's headed to a bad place. Thank you. Uh, let's go to next question from George from Canaccord. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, just to focus on the cost per vehicle, you know, coming down in in future quarters, as you discussed in your written uh, remarks. I'm curious as to what the levers of that could be. Is it more scale, more factory utilization? Uh, is it material cost reductions? Is it things like giga casting? I mean, can you just kind of give us some data points to give us confidence that that's going to come down over time? And if I can sneak one in, please, there are press reports, uh, and I know how perilous it is to believe some of these, <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> uh, but it, they, <laughs> they say that you've included radar as an option in some model wise in China. And I'm just here to ask if that's true, and if so, why? Thank you. Uh, we've not included radar. Uh, we, we, we have radar as a, a Tesla designed radar as an experiment in the model S and X. Uh, that's it. Uh, we'll see whether that experiment is worth it. Um, but there are no plans to, to integrate radar into 3 and Y. Um, you know, just as humans drive. Well, and in fact, an, an excellent human, human driver can drive with, with amazing safety simply with uh, their eyes. Um, the, the car will, will far exceed uh, the average human safety just with vision, far, far, far. Um, because, I mean, the car is looking at all directions at once, and we don't have eyes in the back of my head. So, and, and it, the computer never gets tired and never gets distracted, get drunk, hopefully. Uh, um, and um, so, R radar is, uh, you know, it, it's not. It, 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 what really matters is how much does it affect the probability of an accident. And in order for the radar to be effective, you have to be able to do radar only braking. Or you have to do actions that are that are ra radar only. Otherwise, you get this disambiguation problem between vision and radar. Um, that's why we actually turned off the radar in cars historically that we had shipped. All three and Y used to have radar, but we turned it off because the radar actually generated more noise than signal. Um, now the Tesla designed radar is a high resolution radar that has some potential to be useful, um, but, but the jury is, is still very much out on, on whether that is in fact the case. Um, but, yeah, on, the, saving? on the cost question, I guess from the vehicle side, like, you know, as Drew mentioned earlier, we are always trying to engineer our products to be cheaper to make and more efficient to make. That comes obviously on the engineering side as we come up with new innovations, but as well on the supply chain side with our partners, we work with them to automate some of their lines, remove their um, you know bottlenecks and their high costs as well. On the logistics side, getting parts to the factory, it's yeah, it's not here. it's it's not you yeah, go ahead. It's not like a one thing that yeah, you, you uh, have to it's, it's, you have to attack cost everywhere and. Yeah. And we do it ruthlessly at all times. Operations efficiency, all of the all of the above. Yeah, I mean, I would say there's a whole laundry list of things which we are chasing. We internally call it the cost attack, where we're literally going line by line and saying, how can we make it better? And it's a grind. The grind. It's time. 
it's a game of pennies. It's, a game it's, a game of pennies. Pennies. it's like Game of Thrones, but, but pennies. <laughs> um, is, I mean, first approximation, if you've got a $40,000 car um, and roughly 10,000 uh, items in that car, it, that means each thing on average costs four bucks. Uh, so in order to get the cost down, say, by 10%, uh, you have to get 40 cents out of each part on average. It is a game of pennies. Um, we play it. So Willingly. We play it. <laughs> yeah. Really just we've, we've done it many, many times. Um, and, uh, you, you know, even something as simple as like a, a sticker. <laughs> um, you know, like there's too many stickers in the, internally in the car that nobody ever sees. Uh, there's... It's, you know, um, something as simple as a QR code. You might think, well, putting a QR code on a, on part, why not just put them put them on there? It's like, well, who, are we actually going to use that QR code? Uh, Cost a penny. Yeah, exactly. And then inevitably, sometimes the QR code doesn't go on properly, or you can't read it properly, and then it stops the line. <laughs> Costs more than a penny. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, so, so, so it's chip, chipping away um, with with it, with a. It, I mean, it is trying to. It is. It does feel like digging a tunnel with a spoon at times. <laughs> <laughs> Very much escaping prison. <laughs> yeah. You know, on top of it, uh, like we said, you know, we did some factory upgrades, so we expect volume to go up. That would also bring some savings from higher production. But then, on the flip side, we're going to be ramping a new product like Cybertruck, which we talked about. So. Yeah, so those are the real puts and takes which we are working for. Yeah, but there's, there's not like some accidentally, you know, some gold, brick of gold that we shot and left in the car, um, unfortunately. Um, and, and it's, you know, we, we try to be very rigorous about improving the quality and capability of the car because, you know, it, it's like any fool can re reduce the cost of a car by making it worse. Um, and just you know, deleting functionality and capability, and that—that's that, how I call this sort of the any any fool. It, it's like if you want to like lose weight, and you say, "Well, I, would, I need to lose whatever, fifteen pounds right away." Well, you, you could chop your arm off, um, but then you're sitting there with one arm, you know, <laughs> and you're still fat. <laughs> so, so it's like, sort of like, uh, yeah, you gotta work at it. Yeah, you actually have to. Eat, eat less food and work, work out. That's the actual way. And yeah. doctor's advice. Yeah, it's not you know, super fun because food is delicious. And I personally, I'm not a huge, don't, I don't love working out. I know some people do. I wish I did, but I don't. <laughs> Unless moving the mouse consists, consists of working out, in which case I love moving the mouse. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's go to Colin Langham from Wells Fargo. Colin, uh, can you unmute yourself? Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Do you hear me now? Yes. Um, yes. Oh, great. Thanks for my question. Um, you said in the commentary that you're not going full tilt on the plant in Mexico until there's signs that the economy is strong. Can you continue at a 50% CAGR without that plant? And where would that come from? And, and any color on what you mean sort of not going full tilt, could that plant get delayed indefinitely or what are you <laughs> kind of talking about no we're, we're definitely making the the factory uh in mexico we feel very good about that we, we put a lot of effort into looking at different locations and uh we feel very good about that location um and and we are going to build a factory there um and it's going to be great um the question is really just one of timing and uh yeah you know, I'm just going to be a broken record on the on the interest front. It's just the interest rates have to come down. Um, like like if 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 interest rates keep rising, you just fundamentally reduce affordability. Um, it is just the same as right increasing the price of the car. So I just don't have visibility into. If you can tell me what the interest rates are, I can tell you when you know <laughs> when we should, we should build the factory. We are going to build it, and um, you know, I mean, I think we'll. We'll we'll start the you know initial phases of construction next year, um, but uh, I, I I am still somewhat scarred by 2009 when um, General Motors and Chrysler went bankrupt. 
So, well, that's now 14 years ago. Uh, it's that that is seared into my mind with a branding iron. Um, because uh, you know Tesla was just hanging on by a thread during that entire time, and with the, I mean, and we closed off a, a financing round in 2008 on at 6 p.m. December 24th, Christmas Eve, and if we had not closed that financing round, we we would have bounced payroll two days after Christmas. Um, so we, we we actually closed that round on the last hour of the last day that it was possible. Um, stressful to say the least, um, and then barely made it through 2009. Um, so I'm like, I want to just, I, I don't want to be going at top speed into uncertainty. Um, a lot of wars going on in the world, obviously, as well. Um, so, um, and, and we have room here. Like in Kika, Texas, you said we're, we still have room in this building. It's yeah. not full yeah. with Cybertruck and Model Y, and you know there's plenty of growth opportunities still to have inside the building where our team already is. We also have 2,000 acres here. Yeah. So there's also a lunch bunch more. We're actually only occupying a tiny corner of the land that we are. Um, so you know we could we could technically do all the scaling necessary just here. Um, so um, I mean. Personnel is our biggest challenge in, in, in that the greater Austin area only has, generously, the greater Austin area only has 2 million people. So people are moving here and they're willing to move here, but there is somewhat of a housing crisis. <laughs> they got to live somewhere. Um, so, yeah. Um, okay, yeah so, I so, 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 so I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just curious. Uh, like I just, I'm not saying things will be bad. I'm just saying they might be, and I, I think, uh, like, like Tesla is a is an incredibly capable ship, but it is, but but if you know, we need to make sure, like, as as if it's, if the macroeconomic conditions are stormy, you know, you, you should, even if the the best ship is still going to have tough times, the weaker ships will sink. We're not going to sink, but. Uh, but, you know, even a great ship in a storm has has challenges. Now that storm will apply to everyone, not just us, and not just not not just the auto industry. It apply to everyone, I think. Um, so, you know, apart from necessary sort of staples like food and stuff, but um, you know, so I just I don't know um, if. if if interest rates start coming down, we will accelerate. Um, all right. I, I, if anybody's got, got, got any, 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 any guesses on this, I, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to be less wrong. Um, and, and I apologize if I'm, if I'm perhaps more paranoid than I should be, because that might also be the case, because I, I, I have PTSD from 2009, big time. Um, and in 2017 through 19, we're not picnic either. That was very, very tough going. So, um, you know, the, the auto industry is, is also somewhat cyclic it's because, uh, you know, people tend to hesitate to buy a new car um, in, if, if there's uncertainty in the economy. Um, so, so it's, you know, car companies do very well in good economic times and they, have don't, don't do as well in in tough economic times. Uh, so it's it's just you know. Whereas if somebody's selling bread, then I think you know that people still need to have bread. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. You need bread. If you need food all the time, but new car, you don't have to have bread. Right Especially if you have wars going on, and then that impacts your sentiment. Yeah, I mean, if people are reading about wars all over the world. If this, uh, you know, buying a new car tends to not be front of mind. All right. Unfortunately, that's all the time we have today. Thank you very much for all of your good questions, and we'll see you again in three months. Thank you very much.
All right, hey everybody. Let's do some uh, recapping of that call. Let me know if you guys can hear me okay. I'll give it a second here. Things, try to get things into position. Let me know on the audio level if that's if this is alright for you guys. And we'll talk about. We got a lot to talk about. Sounds good? Okay, thanks. Hear you. Audio good. Alright. Yeah, let me know if the levels are okay. Uh, just kind of guessing a bit here. All right. Well, I'm seeing a lot of comments. <laughs> uh, seeing a lot of comments about people saying that the call was depressing. Yeah, I mean, obviously not the... If I had to line up my favorite earnings calls, this certainly would not be not be the tops. Um, I think this kind of extends what we had talked about. Uh, hopefully you guys had seen the shareholder letter and their reaction to the financials and all that stuff. But I think this kind of carried forward what we had talked about during that recap, where on the vehicle capacity page, Tesla had talked about uh, four Giga Texas, four Giga Berlin, and then four um, Shanghai. All three of those factories, Tesla gave comments about relatively slow ramp ups from here. So Berlin and Texas, they said, you know, slow ramps. And then for the uh, Giga Shanghai, they said, you know, we're, we're basically fully ramped for the time being. So I think what we heard from Elon here confirmed what we had sort of guessed at that point was that Tesla is taking their foot off the accelerator a bit in terms of production growth during this period of time, uh, obviously higher interest rates than we've had for the last few years. Uh, still relative to historical interest rates. Obviously, the, there have been times in the past where it's been higher, but um, as Elon said, it is obviously impacting payments. And despite significant price cuts from Tesla, when you're financing a vehicle, like most people are doing, uh, that's going to impact affordability. The EV tax credit obviously should be offsetting a significant portion of that in the United States, not necessarily internationally, obviously. Um, however, as Elon pointed out, because it's not a point of sale credit right now, it's also non-refundable credit right now, the eligibility for that and the impact of that is a little bit limited. So hopefully those things both improve a little bit heading into next year, even if we do see some reductions in credits. Um, so hopefully those are you know positive factors. And hopefully we're also at the top of the interest rates. I mean, we've heard Fed comments now about maybe pausing for a bit. Um, so we seem to be getting closer. And I think the market's expectations are kind of indicating that right now too. So um, you know, hopefully things are getting to a point where we're starting to change a bit in terms of the trajectory, which will be pretty potentially pretty meaningful. So outside of that, I mean, I don't know that there's, you know, a whole lot that we learned that was kind of new on this call. Obviously, we got some details on Cybertruck, Elon talking about how this is going to be pretty difficult to ramp. We should have known that now for a while. Obviously, at the unveiling, uh, part of the pitch of the Cybertruck was that this was going to be a little bit of an easier to produce vehicle uh, because of how it's designed. But over time, that you know, sort of narrative changed from Tesla. And as there are a lot of new things with this, unsurprisingly, I think, you know, it's going to be a long time. It's going to be a long ramp to profitability um, as any new vehicle would be. So just something to keep in mind, especially next quarter as that starts to hit. Um, I'm just going to kind of cycle through my notes here and we can go point by point because I know there's things in here. Uh, sorry for the audio dropping a couple times. Um, that was on, on Tesla's end on YouTube. Nothing I could do here. It sounded like maybe the X version of the audio for the interview or for the earnings call was okay. So I might have to switch to that as the feed next time. We'll we'll see if that was okay and we'll see what we missed if that did actually get captured. Uh, but again, apologies for that. Um, all right. So just looking through here, you know, sort of opening comments is kind of stuff that we've all talked about either in the shareholder letter or prior to this um, in previous episodes or earnings calls. So Cybertruck, volume production, yeah, difficult, difficult, all stuff that we kind of know. I think I'm, maybe I didn't quite understand or I couldn't quite hear, uh, or maybe it dropped a bit when they were talking about energy margins. We'll have to go back and review that. Obviously, that was one of the real big highlights this quarter was energy margins going to 24%. As Elon noted, that's their best margin business now uh, with non-X credit automotive gross margin coming in at like 16.3%, I believe. Uh, but even including regulatory credits in the 18% range. 
So for Megapack to now be 24%, that's super, super exciting. Uh, obviously that business continues to grow quickly. And right now Tesla is doing about 16 gigawatt hours annually, but they're ramping their production to 40 gigawatt hours just from, uh, just from their California facility. And then they'll also add the China facility uh, as well and ramp that up to 80. So there's a lot of growth left in that business, which is exciting, especially as Elon's comments indicate, we're probably at a little bit of a plateau period now for Model Y and Model 3. And obviously S and X have reached that, you know, for quite some time. So at least we've got a little bit to look forward to there with Megapack kind of continuing to drive some growth uh, as, you know, we wait for some next generation vehicles like Cybertruck, like Semi, like next generation vehicle, uh, the lower cost vehicle to help drive growth again. And then obviously macroeconomic changes could contribute to that as well. Um, let's see. So no answer on Cybertruck deliveries. And I'm not surprised. Elon's never really ever given, an, you know, a specific number like that. He always talks about things in terms of run rates. So basically saying they'll get to, you know, 5,000 a week sometime in, in 2025, probably reaching that rate. That doesn't mean 250,000 produced in 2025. It just means, you know, reaching that rate sometimes in 20, sometime in 2025. And obviously on the earnings report letter, Tesla indicated greater than 125,000 as the production capacity. So I would, I would expect they're kind of initially ramping to that uh, and then continuing to ramp in sort of like a phase two way up to 5K a week, <clears throat> again, in about 18 months. Uh, 4680, Drew always lists those stats off super quickly, so it's kind of hard to catch them. Um, but he did say that production increased 40% quarter over quarter. I think that's actually not quite as rapid of growth as we'd seen in Q2. I think it was 80% if I remember correctly, but obviously that base is going to be significantly higher as um, off of those types of growth rates. Annualized, that's still you know very strong. Um, and then it sounds like they're going to be making probably the next step change sometime in early 2024. Drew mentioned that they've got four lines of 4680 production um, capacity under construction. Uh, I can't remember what phase he quite said that they were in. Again, that was pretty quick. But target to start producing that in May 2024, uh, which, you know, we're going to be there before we know it. So that'll be, I think, a pretty significant bump for 4680s. And hopefully that's the point in time where, you know, there are a, lot of, a lot of questions on the call about like, okay, cost reductions. How do we, how do we go from here? Um, is this trend that we're seeing going to continue in cost reductions of, on the average vehicle? One of the, one of the things that's going to drive that is obviously 4680s. That's been sort of artificially inflating cost of goods sold per vehicle right now. Uh, as they do this, certainly once this phase two is ramped up, um, that's going to go from an economic drain to something that is hopefully positive. Uh, I think Drew maybe said something on a cost there that they're you know kind of working towards that, but still have improvements uh, to make. Cato, that's going to be their next generation sort of test facility. No, no big surprise on that right now, uh, but they're kind of working on retooling it for the presumably sort of like phase two cyber cell right now, which maybe that is, you know, aligned with their plans there for May, uh, but maybe another generation after that. Uh, Berlin and Austin. So, I mean, we've, we've kind of been talking about this now for a while when we got back, you know, if we go back to those reports about shifts and things like that, that we've been hearing about, particularly for Berlin. At the time we were getting those rumors, you know, I made the call out that I wouldn't be too surprised if Tesla is, rather than focusing on continuing to ramp up production, more focused on cost of production for their current, you know, level of production. So I think that's where we're at. You know, Austin a little bit different. We had the downtime there this quarter. That'll have to re-ramp up from that downtime. Uh, but presumably Tesla put in some cost improvement um, things in place during that downtime. But I think for both these factories, then Tesla is just saying, hey, we're not going to bump these up to 500000 a year on the Model Y because of this environment that we're in right now. So, you know, if Tesla felt better about it, I think there's production capacity on the table there that, you know, Tesla could go after. Uh, this is one of the first times that we've heard of Tesla, you know, not being sort of constrained by production, I would say, which will be an interesting period for them because they'll be able to, not that I'm trying to spin that as a good thing, I, I would prefer that they, you know, obviously have as much demand as they, as they would like, but, um, since it is kind of a unique period in, in Tesla's history, it'll allow them to do things a little bit differently, take a little bit of a different approach and focus on some things that, you know, they normally maybe would put to the side during a period of time where they're a little bit more focused on growing production, which can have some long-term benefits. Again, I'm not saying that's, you know, better in terms of those two scenarios, but I do think it's worth, you know, considering that there will be different sort of targets and goals for Tesla during a period like this that might have some interesting learnings and 
improvements that can be put in place for them longer term as well. Uh, Mexico, so same kind of story there with Berlin and Austin, just not really going, you know, full pedal, pedal, <laughs> pedal to the metal on Mexico at this point. So Elon said that, you know, he thinks that they'll start construction next year. I think originally, you know, sort of the original communication we heard was, I don't know, like nine months or something. I think we kind of thought that it would start this year, 2023. So if they do start next year, it's not like it's the you know most significant delay in the world. And really, the, you know, the point in time from which they start to when they actually start producing vehicles is probably the most critical factor. Uh, but as we had talked about, Tesla's kind of already made the decision to, rather than kick off the next generation vehicle in Giga Mexico, to kind of move that over to Giga Texas. So I don't think that Mexico is really a gating factor for, you know, really anything in, in the next year or maybe even two years. Um, so, I, you know, obviously my preference would be for them to kind of get started on that earlier just so it's ready to go when they when they feel like it, it can go. Um, but at the same time, there's probably some time that we've got here where they can, you know, wait a bit before it starts being super impactful to, you know, longer term things. Now, obviously it presents a little bit of a gap next year and maybe 2025 even uh, where, you know, probably one of the... The more disappointing things from this call was, I don't know where in the notes this was, but um, yeah, so 50%. So yeah, that, that was something I was really disappointed to hear from Elon. You know, originally the plan, um, this probably goes back to, I don't know, like 2020, 2021, I think is what Tesla says it was in their in their earnings report. But I think even before that, there were comments about, yeah, 50% compound annual growth rate is kind of the target. That gets us to 4 million or so in, in 2024 or sorry, in 2025, uh, gets us to 20 million in 2030, actually ab- above that. But, um, you know, that was that was kind of the targets that were laid out, right? It, it was 50% kegger and it was, you know, roughly 4 million in, in 2025, although a little bit less specificity around that one, uh, and, you know, 20 million in, in 2030. This, to me, sounds like an early indication of like, hey, that's that's not the benchmark anymore, at least for right now, which that's obviously super disappointing. Um, now things can change when there's less economic uncertainty, those targets can come back on the table, but the longer they're delayed for, you know, as we kind of talk about Giga Mexico and how that fits into this, these things, the longer those are delayed for the less aggressive that Tesla is, which I don't think they're getting like super less aggressive, just, you know, less aggressive than we know Tesla to be historically, which is probably pretty hyper aggressive. I think Tesla is still being aggressive. They're just not sort of, you know, the Tesla aggressive that we've that we've come to know and and obviously love. Uh, so, and I think this is a, you know, this along with indications about, you know, Giga Mexico, Berlin, Austin, et cetera, are indications of that. Um, and I think, you know, long-term that that will have an impact in terms of pushing out some of these targets that, that Tesla has kind of laid out. So, uh, again, that that part of the the call, and even in the shareholder letter, you know, we kind of sort of started to get an allusion to that. Um, it, is definitely disappointing. Uh, Robo taxi stuff. I mean, we've we've heard it so many times now. Um, yeah, not not sure there was anything too new on that. I wish we would have heard a little bit more about FSD twelve. Um, the little bit that we did here, I think, was not super encouraging because Elon said, you know, the more geographies or regions or localities that we try to put FSD in, the harder the problem gets. Obviously, it's already an extremely hard problem. So that's very intuitive and not at all surprising. But at the same time, FSD 12 and 10 neural network, that is supposed to be something that kind of not alleviates those problems, but hopefully kind of addresses them. Um, So for him to talk about FSD 12 at the same time as talking about how it's harder to do in, in different geographies and things like that. While it does make sense is also, you know, I wish it would have just been presented a little bit more bullishly, I guess, if, if that makes sense, uh, than how it was. So not something I'm necessarily like super disappointed in on, on that front, but um, I don't think we got anything like excellent or super exciting about FSD 12, which is probably one of the things that, you know, right now when we're, as we had talked about in the shareholder letter, right now when we're kind of waiting for those next generation of products, um, if FSD can make some good progress, that also something that kind of bridges that that gap potentially. Uh, but we have obviously have to wait and see. Optimus, uh, we kind of heard about that. Elon didn't want to give any indication of you know 
production or whether or not that'd be useful next year. Um, he had previously said I would, so I wouldn't say it's, you know, necessarily tempering expectations on that, but seemed a little bit less bullish than, than the last update. Uh, but obviously we just saw, you know, the video that Tesla put out, which I think was, was pretty exciting. Uh, price on FSD, so temporarily low, basically, you know, Elon didn't say it during this part, one of the rare, <laughs> the rare parts that didn't come back to interest rates, but I do think, you know, obviously with, with the higher interest rates, Tesla lowering the price of FSD is somewhat commensurate with those interest rate increases as well. Um, so I think that's probably played a role there. The Mercedes level three stuff, I like the question actually. Some people might be surprised by that. I usually don't love all the questions, but uh, the question is interesting because, you know, Tesla's system is obviously on a holistic level, just not even really comparable with, with Mercedes. It's so far ahead uh, in terms of what it can actually do. But Mercedes has decided to focus on just a very narrow operational domain. Uh, and in that narrow domain, accepting the liability for it. So I wish it would have been framed differently than it was so that we could have gotten a better answer on it. I mean, sometimes it's difficult because you can frame a question perfectly and Tesla can answer it however they want. They don't have to answer it, but, uh, it, you know, it is an interesting thing to think about, especially again, during this period where maybe there's not as much growth in the other parts of the business. If Tesla were to say, Hey, while FSD is still in development, can we dedicate a very small portion of our time to starting to, you know, conquer some of these domains essentially where, you know, Tesla is starting to accept liability. And when they do that, I think that creates a tremendous amount of value for customers, even if it's not the solution that Tesla is working towards. And ultimately they have to make the decision because whether or not the worth, the work that would go into something like that is worth it. That's, you know, a decision that I don't think any of us could make without that information about how much work it would be. But if it were easy enough and Tesla could offer something like this in a broader area and under broader circumstances, I think that customers would would really appreciate that. Uh, if you can sort of get your time back, I mean, that's kind of what Ford has talked about, that they're they're just working on that now instead of FSD. Um, but like, like just ima imagine that, you know, you've got the split of autopilot and FSD and the autopilot functionality, although it's limited in terms of where you can use it, if you could use it and it takes over the liability and you don't have to pay attention, I think people would be much more willing to pay for a, a monthly subscription for that or you know, we talked a little bit earlier today about paying per mile or something like that. Um, I think that that becomes instantly more valuable and, and people can recognize the, the value of that a lot easier as well. So it's interesting, again, you know, we didn't really get into that in, in terms of the answer, uh, but I do wonder as, as the, the longer that FSD takes, the more something like that I think is going to make sense. And that's where it's just kind of the, the balance of like, how much effort do you want to spend on that versus just trying to, you know, get the full solution. And obviously Tesla so far has, has picked to dedicate everything to the full solution, which ultimately I think is the right move. But, you know, there's some some space in there for other decisions that could be interesting. Uh, Optimus, we talked about that. Progress tends to look like a log curve. We kind of talked about that. Elon's mentioned those things before. Ramp of the Cybertruck, so... Yeah, this was a little bit more positive than I think initially maybe people would have interpreted it as. Um, 18 months, you know, I, I don't think anyone should be surprised by that. We've we've seen vehicle ramps many, many times. And best case scenario, you're talking about something in Giga Shanghai that's already been produced somewhere else. And even that's going to take a year, um, you know, maybe best case kind of like nine months. Um, so no, no surprise on that, especially with uh, obviously the unique complexity with the Cybertruck that they mentioned. Uh, high volume, low cost, smaller vehicle, much more conventional, conventional in terms of technology. Uh, I didn't catch the exact comment from Lars, but he said something about like, there's no stainless steel inventions that they need to make. Um, I know a lot of people wonder if it's going to be Cybertruck esque those comments to me definitely indicated not that direction, which has been my opinion for a while. So maybe I'm just biased in terms of my interpretation of it, but, um, you know, he could mean that since they've already done it with Cybertruck, it is no longer new then for the next generation vehicle. But uh, just based on everything that they said, they're more conventional, um, utilitarian. Like, I, I don't think that it's going to be, you know, Cybertruck style. Audio cut out. We'll have to kind of figure out what that is. Uh, Elon again saying it's, it's a utility, still beautiful, but utilitarian. FSD stuff we've heard a thousand times. 
I don't think Pierre quite got his got his question answered on that one. Um, sequential margin changes, mega pack, and yeah, pricing stuff. Just looking through to see what else we may not have covered yet. So we have not included Model Y uh, radar. So we talked about that a couple of days ago. It's just something that was an option in the paperwork. Um, I don't think anyone necessarily thought that they were putting it in already, but maybe, and Elon's answer here didn't disclude this possibility. Maybe Tesla just has left it open in case that you want to add, you know, the, the Tesla designed radar at some point. Uh, the game of pennies. <laughs> Elon had some good jokes in there. Um, I was laughing. Uh, volume. It's, it's unclear exactly the volume comments. I mean, the volume is going to increase, obviously, from where we're at now in Q3 because of the downtime. But at the same time, they said that volume is not going to ramp that much further. So I think CFO was talking about just how volume will increase from where it was this quarter. But I, I don't expect that that also meant that they'll continue to significantly increase that. As for next year, you know, I was asked about what the unit guidance might be for next year and they they said you know we'll have an update on that on the next call i think this is another good time where it's really helpful for people to just sit down and like model the business it doesn't have to be anything like super detailed or crazy uh, but just kind of look at production by factory and see what you think makes sense it, it is difficult to find a path to you know really significant increases next year and that becomes even more difficult which is kind of what the analysts are trying to capture here. You can kind of tell by their questions um, that with with the updates about not much increases in Shanghai, Berlin, Texas, obviously Mexico is not going to contribute next year. Um, Fremont, we kind of know what it is, right? Like we, I don't think anyone expects any major increases there. So after the Highland ramp, you know, it's, it's just kind of difficult to see where any additional volume starts to come from. Um, and then when you're in that scenario, you're kind of capped on what the, what the volume can be for next year. So that kind of comes back to the plateau thing. And this, again, this is why I've been talking about sort of that for a while is because you, you, you know, you sit down there and you have to model these things out and at a certain point it just kind of, kind of stops. So that's not necessarily a bad thing. Like, obviously we'd all prefer that Model 3 and Model Y just kept growing to infinity, but obviously that's that's not possible. At a certain point, you just you, you got to wait for the next generation platform. Tesla was at, at this point back in, you know, 2016, 2017, as we waited for Model 3. Um, Model Y was quick enough that we didn't have much of that with the Model 3, but we would have had that eventually with the Model 3 and had to wait for Model Y. Uh, but because it was so similar, we just kind of, you know, Tesla kind of stacked those on top of each other, which was nice. But now, you know, we're at the tail end of that ramp and we're just kind of waiting for uh to get to the next generation so um obviously if if interest rates had stayed at zero percent for longer then tesla probably could have continued to ramp it you know more aggressively like they sort of initially i think had in mind with berlin and texas but uh with that being not the case anymore you know tesla just adjusting as as they should be to be good managers of the business i know we'd all love it to be a little bit different than it is but it is probably prudent for Tesla to just, you know, assess the information that they have at, the, at this point in time and uh, adjust accordingly. And although that might set them some things back, you know, I still have full confidence that Tesla's well equipped to manage these things, these periods, which, you know, they're not quite as fun as the, <laughs> the periods that we had in whatever 2020 and 2021. But again, same same thing with the stock. You can't expect years like that every every single year either. Uh, many people that have been in Tesla forever obviously know the, not not necessarily like the pain that comes with holding, but just like the the patience that you have to have with a, a long term investment. And that's why a lot of early Tesla investors kind of preach that that patience and long term mindset. It's because you know there are plenty of periods, different different things, but plenty of periods like this that were tough and you know not super exciting about the business. I'm sure people remember you know some of the. Some of the things with like Model X and and some of the guidance that Tesla gave and it ended up being way off and it's just like oh man this this is looking not good but again long term everything's great and I think we're probably in a situation like that again where yeah the business is not increasing as quickly as it was at one point but there is still so many different things to be excited about with the business like someone yesterday made a comment of, of like 
oh, you're, you've got this $800 billion company and all of that value or that 500 billion of that is, is coming down to FSD. I mean, not really. You've got FSD, but you've also got Cybertruck, you've got Semi, you've got the next generation vehicle, which is going to be bigger than Tesla's entire unit volume right now. Like, do people understand that? <laughs> Probably by a significant margin. Um, so that's, you know, those are those things are all on the horizon. And um, so many other things, supercharging Tesla insurance, energy, like 24% gross margins on Tesla energy. That's phenomenal. I don't think many people would have, um, ex- except for maybe those small little Twitter Twitter crew uh, that were probably a little bit over optimistic, but you know, certainly in the analyst community or in Wall Street, I don't think anyone would have really expected that. Um, and that's a, a very exciting business. I mean, that was what a third of Tesla's profit, or well, more like a tenth of Tesla's profit this this quarter, um, but growing and growing more quickly. So uh, I think there's tons to be excited about with the energy business. Um, and you know, there's there's a long long list of of things in the business that that Tesla's doing. And then you got to consider competition, right? Like, yeah, things aren't as exciting in in the financials for Tesla right now as they were a year ago. But like, look at look at the announcements that we're hearing from Ford. Look at the situation that Ford GM Stellantis are in right now at the UAW. Uh, we just heard from GM earlier this week that they're delaying investments in EVs. Um, like, that's that's going to hurt them. Just like t- you know, just like we talked about with Tesla not being quite as aggressive might shift some of Tesla's things back a little bit. Uh, That probably goes double or triple for a company like GM. Um, I would much prefer to be in the situation where Tesla's in and, you know, have the capability of of delivering these products, earning cash flow and reinvesting that cash flow into their future growth, both in, in terms of AI and in terms of vehicles and energy and all the other stuff we just listed, than be in a position like GM where it's like, oh, man, we're kind of reliant on these ICE vehicles, which are becoming more and more expensive because of interest rates. And then we also have to be making all these new investments in this EV business that we really don't know much about, that we really have no uh, historical success with, that only looks like it's going to be draining our profitability. And by the way, Tesla's out there and they just don't really care. They're going to cut prices and make things more affordable and and they can manage to do that because they're already at scale. That's what you got to compete with. Like <clears throat> This is just night and day in terms of the comparison with Tesla's businesses and you know you've got BYD out there that's that's doing well but that's that's pretty much it um you know Volkswagen looked like maybe it was taking the steps in the right direction but they've they've regressed so far in the last year uh Toyota continues to just do nothing so the market's wide open and you know Tesla's continues to be significantly better positioned than anybody out there to take it so that's where we say like yeah this is maybe a disappointing quarter still a lot to be excited about long term it's we talked earlier about like holding two thoughts in your mind at the same time and that's one of it uh people you know again sitting here saying in the chat like a depressing call like rob looks depressed people just say that all the time we talked about that (laughs) earlier today as well but no it's it's fine i mean again ton long 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 list of things to be excited about and i don't think any of those i don't think that list of things changes right like the only thing that maybe changes a little bit today is that we, you know, we, we probably get a little bit lower peak ramps for Model Y in Berlin and Texas. Like, well, do I own Tesla stock because I thought that Berlin and Texas were going to produce 250,000 more Model Ys than they might? No. <laughs> like, that's not really a contributing factor at all. So um, while I would love if they could do that and Tesla earns more money and the stock price is better faster, that'd be awesome. But it's also not why I you know, why I'm an investor in Tesla, why I've been an investor in Tesla for more than a decade, um, and probably will continue to be an investor for a decade, because I'm excited about these other things, not just about, you know, Model 3 and Model Y. All right, well, that was a <laughs> long comment. Um, definitely making Mexico, Giga Texas, we talked about some of the, the things there. Um, yeah. All right, yeah, so I mean, a lot of stuff there again people are saying like elon's depressed too it's just stop stop reading into stuff like that it's it's rarely accurate as i have found from people assessing my own mood on a daily podcast like elon's got a lot going on doesn't necessarily reflect on anything that he's talking about at that moment obviously there's things that aren't super exciting that he has to share here but um so it could be but just 
It's that's not a, a very accurate route to go down, which I can say from my my own personal experience pretty confidently. All right, looking at the stock here, so down about 4%. Obviously, we started off uh, a lot higher <laughs> before the call. I'm not surprised again. I, I think the there's there's not a lot in the call to be like really happy about or really support the stock in the short term, certainly. So I'm not surprised. I was actually surprised, as, as we talked about earlier, that the stock was up after the report because I think that it alluded to a lot of the stuff that we heard on the call. Maybe people just didn't quite catch that yet, but um, I'm not surprised. I... I I think, you know, it, I wouldn't, I also wouldn't be surprised if it gets a little bit tougher from here. Analysts are going to go back now and I'm not sure what consensus is for 2024 right now, but anyone that kind of had significant growth is going to have to probably come, come back and, and cut that sort of stuff out. So if anything, price targets are probably coming down from here. Not that that's really the main factor that's going to drive the stock or anything like that, but uh, I'd be surprised if we get a lot of upgrades or anything coming out of this call. <clears throat> So, all right, what questions you guys got? <laughs> this is a, usually we kind of wrap these up a little bit quicker, but I'll stick around and if people want to just kind of ask them questions, I know it's, again, calls like this, not, not the most fun. So um happy to stay a little bit longer and just kind of chat. Probably a little bit better for X spaces, but. I did see some super chats come through. I can't, this software is different. Luckily we made it through the call. If you guys remember last quarter I had issues. I had completely set this up on a new computer now. So, uh, seems like we were okay, except for Tesla's drops. Rex, thank you. Appreciate that. Good to, good to see you on here. Uh, Elon should come on Tesla daily every few months to talk about anything and everything and stay off these calls. Make it half and rough. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I guess I would take that. Um, just trying to see. Um, somebody asked, did I miss Highland release dates? No, Tesla just kind of punted on that. But Motor Trend did <clears throat> did say it was going to be January, and then Tesla apparently requested for them to update to uh, Q1. So that seems to be at least you know the best information that we have right now, which I think people were kind of already expecting that based on some rumors previously. Uh, Alec, asked, Alec asking, do you see more price cuts? I don't know. I mean, there's a, there's quite a few things that are going to work in Tesla's favor here. Obviously, Highland, that's going to help. And Tesla's actually raised prices on the Model 3 internationally where that's been introduced. So that should help both ASP and margins. Um, but we'll see, you know, how long that can be sustained. Tesla might drop that over time. Um, as we talked about, the point of sale change for the EV credit, that'll be offset a bit by the possible reductions, particularly for Model Y. But those being point of sale and those being refundable, effectively refundable, I don't know if it's technically worded that way, but becomes effectively refundable. Those are big changes that are very positive that should help in you know the beginning of the year. Um, and then like we heard from Tesla today, they've sort of decided, I think, to sort of take their foot off the gas or off the pedal for ramping production. And you know, even though even though earnings are down this year, deliveries are still up. Like Tesla's still going to grow deliveries by like 50%, right? So when you do that, you need to do that through pricing most likely. Um, you don't just get to sell 50% of the same thing at the same price. Otherwise, you were probably significantly underpricing it before. So I'm not surprised with production increasing that prices would come down. Obviously, it's a little bit faster than I think most of us would have modeled for. But obviously, that trend you know, or, or that relationship shouldn't be surprising. So if there is now a period of time where Tesla is not increasing production as significantly, like not at this 50% rate anymore, there should be less downward pressure on pricing um, at that sort of stagnant level of production. Now, which of those is preferable? Uh, up to people to decide, but um, just, again, that relationship exists. So uh, one thing we skipped over here that I meant to mention, I, I just didn't catch it in the notes because I think it was a, just a one short one, but... Elon did say, you know, we are advertising. He seemed relatively positive about how that could affect the business in terms of the benefit that it could have. So I think that'll be a welcome thing for people um, as they kind of process things. You know, there's a lot to sort through here, but I think as people kind of circle back around to that, that'll be something that at least analysts and Wall Street kind of view as a positive. And 
I'd expect that we'll see more efforts from Tesla on that, uh, especially as they kind of, you know, operating mar- operating margins come lower and they've got less room. Like when you're sitting there at a 19% or 15% operating margin, it's pretty easy to just say, okay, let's just cut prices, right? When you're sitting there and you're at 7% boosted by half a, half a billion dollars in regulatory credits, that type of a decision is much less simple. So Tesla wants to continue to be free cash flow positive. They want to continue to earn money to support the business, which has always been the argument in favor of um, in favor of advertising, right, is to help boost margins so that Tesla can have money to continue to to grow in the ways that we want them to grow. Um, that, I don't know why that is sometimes so difficult, but um, that's that's always been the argument for it. And I think you know that that argument becomes stronger as you both as you bring costs down and as you get your margins lower because you just you know you need to figure out something to kind of sustain those um and advertising can be a lever that can help with that um and as pricing comes down is is a key part of that too because and I've, i've always said this since the beginning i have no problem with tesla lowering prices i just wanted to also kind of see them do things to maybe help support on the margin side where i think there's a little bit of opportunity and as elon's acknowledging here there probably is um and rather than even arguing that they should do it more of just like they should try something and understand the effect um so with with prices coming down i think that's always been the right move like tesla was never gonna continue to sell two million cars a year at whatever sixty thousand dollars or fifty eight thousand dollars or whatever the asp peaked at um so they needed to come down, but you can also do things during that period to, to help support profits as you work prices down too. So it's maybe not how I would have organized it time-wise, but if Tesla ends up doing both of those things where they've got prices down, they're you know, trying to help boost awareness through whatever methods, advertising being one of them, then I think that you know both of those things work, work well in tandem. Um, all right, so that was again kind of a long rant. <laughs> did see i think a couple of super chats here um tesla pilot saying he's only doing the minimum advertising to appease i mean that's what it seems like so far um i'm not gonna make that quite as harsh of a judgment on that yet because again there's you know plenty plenty of time to go forward and do these things obviously i I would say tesla's advertising efforts so far have been pretty extremely minimal but there's nothing wrong with starting slow and learning about it and you know making bigger bets as you as you go and as you learn uh so we'll see you know what they have in store in the future if we're sitting here a year from now and they've only you know done some airport advertising and um you know a few google ads then yeah that, that's a different conversation i think but um I, I don't really have a problem with sort of a slow start to it um okay let's see uh rob thanks for the super chat did they mention why they borrowed 2.2 billion no this is something that i meant to come back to you from the shareholder letter i don't know that i want to we can come back to that tomorrow in tomorrow's episode i don't want to dig through it while you guys are watching here but um yeah tesla did mention 2.3 billion raised in cash from financing activities so we need to go back and just kind of look at what that was um i don't know that there was a yeah, I'm not sure. We just need to go back and look at that one. It's a good question, though. Try to get that figured out for tomorrow. Um, okay. Just trying to get caught up with the the chats here. Uh, Victor saying, folks thinking increasing advertising will fix everything is just wrong. Sorry, it makes no sense. Yeah, I mean, if that's the sort of black and white line that you want to draw of, of like, is advertising going to fix everything? <laughs> Heck no, definitely not. Um, I think there's probably a small portion of people that are saying that. I think most people that are arguing for it are probably thinking that it's something that will be helpful and something that they would like to see Tesla do. Um, certainly there's going to be people on, you know, across the spectrum of that, the argument that they're making. Um, I, don't, I don't know that many people see it as like a silver bullet that's just going to fix things. I think it's more of just like, hey, people don't really get what's going on here with pricing and how good these vehicles are. We should maybe try to tell them. <laughs> a little bit um and maybe that can help margins a bit at the same time all right well um my mouse getting my mouth (laughs) 
my mouth's getting dry. Uh, I'm going to wrap it up though. Uh, again, not depressed. I, obviously it's a little bit disappointing earnings release uh, in terms of the financials, a little bit disappointing in terms of some of the updates from the call, uh, but a lot still to look forward to long-term for Tesla, which is always what it's been about. And any business is going to go through periods of time that are difficult. Uh, Tesla, as much as they are normally the exception to uh, almost everything, <laughs> they're also going to face difficulties just like this. And again, I'm, I'm fully confident in, in Tesla's team that's working on this stuff day in and day out to try to make this business as as strong and as, as beneficial to the world as, as they can. And um, I think that's just kind of a good reminder to bring people back to. Obviously, we're invested. We want to make, make money on our investments. No question about that. Um, if we can do that, though, and also support a company that's you know, doing what Tesla is doing and doing it in a way that I think we can all feel really proud about that, you know, so much, so much better. And, um, you know, we are seeing Tesla do that. It's, it's, it's not GM sitting here and saying, oh, we're just going to, you know, delay this, you know, we're reevaluating our capital, whatever investments. And we're just going to do this next year, maybe <laughs> late next year, actually late 2025. I think it was like, that's a while. Um, you know, Tesla's going as fast as they can, as fast as they think they, they can and still survive, right? I don't want to put it in black and white terms like Tesla's going to go bankrupt or something. That's not going to be the case, but um, they're going to manage the business around challenging periods of time. And and we're just going to have to kind of work through those periods. So um, that's, that's kind of where we're at right now. All right. Well, that'll wrap it up for today. <laughs> we'll be back tomorrow. Plenty more to talk about. Um, stock's down, what, 5% now? Yeah, so tough reaction. I, I wouldn't be surprised again if it continues in that in that direction, but um, we'll see. Uh, let me know in the comments. I'll just try to keep an eye on them. If there's specific topics that you feel like we need to spend a little bit more time on tomorrow, uh, let me know, and we'll, we'll come back to it then. But that'll wrap it up for today. So as always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and signed up for notifications. You can also find me on X at Tesla Podcast. And we'll see you tomorrow for the Thursday, October 19th episode.